Uh, welcome, uh, everybody, to the Whitney and Betty McMillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. We are fortunate today that actually uh, Whitney and Betty McMillan are with us, so uh, uh, thank you for, for being here today. Um, we're delighted to host Ambassador Christopher Hill as this year's George Herbert Walker, Jr. Lecturer in International Studies. Also with us today is the Honorable George Herbert Walker III, Yale class of 1953, and Mrs. Walker. Uh, George Herbert Walker III is a former U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Hungary, and he established this lecture series uh, more than a decade ago now, in 1986, in memory of his father, a distinguished graduate of the Yale College class of 1927. The Walker Lecture is a signature lecture presented by the Macmillan Center each year and has featured em eminent policy practitioners such as Madeleine Albright, Richard Holbrook, and Mamfela Ramfele. Uh, Christopher R. Hill was sworn as in as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs in April of 2005. Ambassador Hill is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service whose most recent assignment was as Ambassador to the Republic of Korea. In February of 2005, he was named as head of the U.S. delegation to the six-party talks on the North Korean nuclear issue. Previously, he has served as U.S. Ambassador to Poland for four years between 2000 and 2004. Ambassador to the Republic of Macedonia, 1996 to 1999, and Special Envoy to Kosovo, 1998 to 1999. He's also served as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Southeast European Affairs in the, in the National Security Council. Ambassador Hill received the State Department's Distinguished Service Award, award for his contributions as a member of the U.S. negotiating team in the Bosnia Peace Settlement, and he was a, a recipient of the Robert S. Frazier Award for Peace Negotiations for his work on the Kosovo Crisis. I'll, t I'll be turning over the podium to Ambassador Hill in, in a minute. Uh, he, his speech will last for about a half an hour. Uh, we'll then have time for some questions and discussions, at the end of which um, I will invite all of you to please join us at a reception upstairs. The, uh, the title that uh, Ambassador Hill has chosen for his lecture today is Pacific Perspectives, U.S. Diplomacy in a Rapidly Changing Age Asia. I'm pleased to introduce Ambassador Hill. Welcome. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, and thank you especially for not reading the entire official State Department bio, because when you get to the bottom of the bio, they list languages that at a certain point in your life you spoke a few words of, but it you know, makes you sound like some incredible polyglot, and at the bottom of it, it says, you know, he speaks Polish, and my Polish is okay. It says Polish and Macedonian. I, I do have some Macedonian. And then it goes on to say, and he speaks Albanian, which I, I've got a few words, and I'm looking out in the audience, and there's Vetin Soroy here from Pristina, and Vetin knows that I don't speak Albanian. So I was really kind of worried that that would, uh, that would come up, but I was spared that. But So uh, C&E, uh, how are you? <laughs> good to see you. Good to see you. It is... Uh, it really is a, uh, a great pleasure to be here uh, and to, uh, to have the opportunity to, uh, to give this lecture. I'm so honored by it. I'm so honored by the presence of the uh, Ambassador, Ms. Walker, who uh, we were together um, when, uh, when he was ambassador in, in Budapest and I was ambassador in, in um, Warsaw. And I think we got together, uh, I don't know, every few months or so, and we kind of get the gang together and we talk about problems of... Uh, of um, sort of transition issues as these countries were not only becoming members of, of NATO, which they had just accomplished, but then went on to become members of the European Union. And as they became members of the Union, the European Union, they still 
retain their status of very good friends of the of the United States. And so, those of us who had the honor to uh, to serve in those countries at the time during this transition, where in in Europe we had to. Uh, you know, make sure people understood that more of the European Union didn't mean less of the United States. It was, um, it was a great opportunity and a great privilege, uh, privilege to serve there. So it, it is a great honor to be at this university, which has so much history and has contributed so much, so significantly to American public life over the last four centuries. Um, it's also an honor to be here at the Macmillan Center, which uh, has, I think, uh, in and of itself, probably a more prestigious uh, uh, history than many, many uh, full-fledged universities around the country. Um, but one of the reasons I like being in Yale is I'm almost back to my home state in Rhode Island, so I can, I can almost see it from here. And uh, when you get to New Haven, you, you can really feel that you will soon be fully in Red Sox country. And so it's, uh, I feel a real, um, real pleasure to, uh, to be here. Um, I'd like to talk about Asia generally and maybe make some even broader points after that. I know that um, I am, some people think I, have, I am the Assistant Secretary not for Asia Pacific, but rather for North Korea. And uh, I want to assure you that, yes, North Korea is important, and I'll get into some of that. But uh, it is very important that we keep a broad perspective on this truly fascinating part of the, uh, part of the world. Just a few weeks ago, I was in, um, actually two weeks ago, I was in uh, Indonesia. I was in Singapore. I was in uh, East Timor, a place that many people may have forgotten about, but is still very much there and very much indeed uh, in need of, of, uh, of a lot of help. And it was a real good reminder of the fact that the United States, I think, is very much a, um, a player in that part of the world, and we very much need to be, continue to be engaged. There are many different issues, issues that we deal with. You know, if you look at China in and of itself, I mean, a lot of people look at China in terms of uh, a couple of main issues, but it, it is truly amazing what, when you come into the office in the morning and you see what has happened overnight in China, whether it's a land protest in a rural area in China or, or uh, some sort of uh, economic development there, it's the uh, natural disasters as well. I mean, China is just immense immense in its uh, scope, immense in its uh, possibilities, and immense really in its problems. If you go to Indonesia, there, uh, there are extraordinary number of, uh, of issues going in this enormous uh, democracy, country of some 230 million people. You know, I'd come out of working in Europe, especially working in the Balkans and looking at some of these, these states with, uh, you know, 1.8 million people. No offense, Vettin, but I'm just mentioning that. 1.8 million. I think Macedonia is about 1.8 uh, million or 1.9 million. Um, Bosnia, kind of a huge place at 4 million. Then you come over to Asia and you look at uh, you know, uh, consular districts in Chengdu with 220 million people. It really does, uh, it is quite a sobering, uh, sobering thought. And to, um, to get around and see the diversity of Asia, I mean, I went to, uh, in Indonesia, if you're in, in Java, that's uh, one part of the country, but um, when you get to uh, Papua, that's quite another part of the country. And to see some of the problems people grapple with, to look at all the success that is the growth of economies there, and then to see that I guess like every uh, like every uh, part of the world, like every uh, every class, there's someone always a little further behind. And indeed, when we look at Burma, we see a real tragedy of uh, a, tra a tragic country that is not able to make the kind of uh, progress that other uh, other places in the region have made. You know, if you go back to the 1950s and you see what people were predicting in terms of who would be a success in Asia. Burma was always on the, uh, on, on probably the short list of countries to be successful. And yet they have made, uh, I think, made a, uh, some wrong decisions and uh, wrong political decisions. They have a, uh, a, a government there that is simply not meeting the needs of its people and have not been meeting the needs of its people, not just for a few years or a few months, but for decades. So a very sad situation. And then you see, uh, you see some of the breathtaking changes in a very positive sense that have gone on in Asia, uh, South Korea, a country that I've lived in for uh, some five or six years to see what, uh, 
what has been accomplished there. And so it is really extraordinary to see all of these countries together and yet having such enormous diversity. And I think as you travel around in Asia, you're kind of struck by the sense that there is a yearning for a, a, a sense of community that uh, I think has not been developed yet, yet in Asia. And I think part of the work that we do in, in the six party talks, this, era, this effort to try to uh, get together, uh, to get all the players together, that is China, Russia, uh, South Korea, uh, Japan, and the US to try to convince North Korea, uh, first of all, to convince each other that this is not a US problem, this is everybody's problem, and then to convince North Korea that it has to uh, do away with these, uh, with this, these nuclear uh, ambitions. And yet to, um, you realize that one of the things we're beginning to actually accomplish in the six party talks is in fact to build, I think, a set of, uh, of relationships among states that could be the basis for some sort of multilateral process well into the future, even beyond uh, the, the problem of North Korea's nuclear ambitions. Indeed, I would say that already in the six party process, you can see that the U.S. and China have been able to work together in that process in a way that really could not have been foreseen in the, in the past. That is, we work on very practical issues together. We have Kim Jong-il to thank for that. Indeed, I think the North Koreans have been very helpful in bringing the U.S. and China together there. But we see also some other relationships that are, have have uh, gelled in a, very, in a very positive way. We see Japan and China continuing to work together there even when their bilateral relationship was on, uh, was on much, more, uh, much more difficult foundation. So I think as, just as any good architect will tell you that you need a good design and a good team, uh, you need to uh, indeed to, to have all that to build a political structure that, that can last. I think uh, the U.S. certainly shouldn't put itself in the position of telling Asians how to build that community. But I think it is fair for us to try to be in the position of showing that we want to be a part of that community and that in a very real sense we consider ourselves not only a Pacific nation but in many respects an, an Asian nation. I think one of the difficulties of building this kind of multilateralism and this community in, in Asia is I think Asia has been much more uh, based on, on a sort of vertical links, on a sense of hierarchy. Um, you know, a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of Americans don't like to look to Europe for what, uh, what they have done. It seems so passe. But in fact, what Europe has done, what Europe has constructed in terms of uh, relationships among states, is really quite breathtaking. If you look at what they've done since World War II, and if you look at the historical antecedents before that, Europe has done a remarkable job of cobbling together, of, of dealing with, with old problems, and of trying to bring people together at a table and to deal with each other on a principle of equality. And yet, so Europe has been able to develop, I think, much stronger horizontal lines, whereas I think Asia is still bedeviled by this concept that if China is up, then somehow Japan must be down, and that it's difficult to imagine a situation where both Japan and China can be doing very well, and yet that is precisely the situation we want to see uh, developed. We want to see that a, a cooperative community, uh, and to inculcate the notion that a cooperative community, and not just an individual country, I think we'll be better equipped to deal with all the challenges we face, which obviously go beyond the borders of any nation state. And we need to, I think, create the notion uh, or help uh, foster the notion in Asia that uh, um, there is a concept of win-win. I mean, I always uh, noted when I was talking to the uh, North Koreans and I mentioned the concept of, you know, everybody can win out of this process, win-win, and first of all, the interpreter didn't have a word for that, so it came out win-win. And the North Koreans sort of looked at me like I was talking about a, North, uh, about a uh, Burmese general or something. But in fact, win-win is precisely the concept that I think we need to do more of and uh, help inculcate in, uh, in Asia. I think in particular, 
when you look at the, our relationship with China, and I speak at a university that has had such a special relationship with China, I mean, the China Law Center and other important exchanges, I think it really put Yale on the map in China and put China on the map in, at Yale. So I'm struck by the fact that uh, we are seeing, when we look at China today, we are really seeing history in the making. Its development in the past generation has been one of the great stories of our lifetime. Indeed, I think you could argue the development of China has been the story of this century so far. And, um, you know, when you look at these kinds of big stories, I mean, in Washington, you know, everybody, everybody indeed has, a, uh, has an opinion about China. In fact, some people have several opinions about China. China is, is something that no one is really uh, ambivalent about. They like it or they don't like it. And I think we have seen that whether we like it or not, we have to have a productive relationship with 1.3 billion people. Uh, it's not going to be easy because, frankly speaking, the United States and China don't always agree, and we have a lot of differences with China. We have differences with China on issues such as Burma, which is one of China's uh, neighboring states. We differ with China on, on how to deal with the problem of Iran's nuclear ambitions. But I think we also see that within China there is a, a growing openness and that if we can step back from the reports and daily newspapers, we can see that there are really some positive trends there. And uh, to be sure, there will be some very, very difficult problems ahead and indeed problems in the months ahead. The Tibet issue very much comes to mind. But what we need to do is to have a kind of um, a relationship with China where we can bring up these issues and the Chinese don't see, that, don't see us as trying to bring up issues such as Tibet in a way that we are looking to undercut or humiliate China or kind of push China down, but rather we're trying to address issues that frankly are or should be of common, uh, common con uh, concern. I think our president in particular has really reached out to China and made it very clear that he wants to see this, uh, this relationship with China uh, grow. As I go to Southeast Asia, I'm, uh, I do think of the fact that, you know, this is a region of the world that has very close relations with the, with the U.S., and yet there's much more of China in Southeast Asia. But if you look at why Southeast Asia has had very positive growth rates in recent years, you see places like uh, Indonesia with 6%, even Philippines with 55 or 6%, you can see that a reason for why Southeast Asia has been able to grow is that finally the world does have a, uh, have a second engine of, uh, of development, and that second engine of development is China. Is, is China. And so just as uh, those of us representing the United States in, in Eastern Europe contemplating the, um, the entry of these countries into the common market, just, of us, just as we were very aware of how, to, how these countries were trying to balance more of the European Union with a continuing relationship with, um, with the United States, I think the countries of uh, Southeast Asia also want to see more of China because China has been a... Uh, uh, such a um, stimulus to their economic growth, but it doesn't mean they want to see less of the United States. And indeed, I think Southeast Asia is an area where the U.S. and China can, can work together. So as we deal with the problem of having a relationship with uh, 1.3 billion people, I think we do have to sort of look and see how, how to conduct that relationship. And it's pretty clear that finger wagging and uh, lecturing really doesn't work. I mean, it doesn't work with my kids, and it doesn't work, and I'm sure it doesn't work with uh, leadership in China or elsewhere. We have to figure out ways to sit down and, and talk. And, uh, you know, it's instructive to see dur that during the Korean War, when, or at the outset of the Korean War, our only conduit our only source of communication with the Chinese leadership in Beijing was through an Indian diplomat stationed there. And today with China, we have some 57 official, uh, official dialogues with China. I mean, over more than one a week, we're talking to them in all kinds of issues, whether it's food safety, tariffs, whether it's law enforcement issues, 
global warming, new technologies. We're really developing this kind of broad relationship with China. And I think what is even um, more, uh, more heartening is the fact that we have these people-to-people -people exchanges with China. You know, when you go about, when you walk through Beijing, uh, you will see American students everywhere. You'll see American business people everywhere. You see Americans from, uh, from uh, the heartland of our country uh, speaking Chinese and, and learning, to, uh, learning Chinese. And it's pretty heartening that we're able to have this kind of, uh, kind of relationship. Um, and I think this is, uh, these are things that we can feel very positive about. But in having this positive relationship uh, with, with China, we also need to bear in mind that we have other extremely important relationships in, in uh, Asia and that these relationships don't need to suffer as a result of our relationship with China. One that comes to mind is Japan. Japan is the world's second largest economy. It is the home to so much uh, new technology in, in the world. It is a country that truly, as the South Korean president said to uh, President Bush in Camp David last weekend, Japan is a country that truly shares our values of democracy and of uh, market economy. And so as we go forward with China, we don't want a situation where it appears that somehow we, have, uh, uh, we are undervaluing this very special relationship we have had and will continue to have with China, with Japan. The U.S. has a uh, treaty uh, relationship with Japan. Indeed, we have treaty relationships all through East Asia with Japan, with the Philippines, with South Korea, uh, with Australia, and with Thailand. And so these treaty relationships really uh, are essential to, our, to how we conduct ourselves in East Asia in, in a bilateral way, but I think they help anchor the U.S. position there. So, Getting back to the six-party talks, there is, to be sure, much work to be done to, uh, to finish this job. And as we approach it, we are working very closely with our partners. We are working closely with China. We're working closely with, uh, with Japan, with South Korea, and, um, and with, uh, with Russia as well. We are, looking, we are looking for ways to get through process and to implement something that we set up in September 05, and that is a joint statement which calls on North Korea to, uh, to do away with its nu nuclear aspirations. <laughs> Needless to say, it hasn't been easy, and it continues to be a very difficult uh, process, but certainly progress is being made. We have a team led by uh, an American team representing the six parties who are there in North Korea, who are there as of this morning, led by the director of the Korea desk uh, from the State Department, a guy named Sung Kim. And uh, Sung uh, called me up, we're a little bleary-eyed from having spent three days in North Korea. He came through, uh, through the uh, DMZ this morning and um, reported on, on where we are in these discussions. Um, and uh, we are, I think it is fair to say, continuing to make, uh, to make progress. As you know, today uh, there were some, I think, Im important events about the uh, North Korean uh, nuclear activities uh, and especially its proliferation activities with respect to, uh, with respect to Syria. Uh, these issues have been the subject of six-party talks, and they will continue to be discussed in the six-party talks. The information we've shared with Congress, I think, is really a test to our vigilance with regard to North Korean nuclear activities and really serves to underscore the urgency of using the six-party process and all available tools to ensure that North Korea has, in fact, ended its illicit nuclear cooperation with Syria and with any other country and to prevent North Korea's ability to engage in such dangerous activities in the future. Addressing North Korea's proliferation activities is very much integral to achieving verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and ending the threat posed by nuclear North Korea. In July 2007, we began a process of shutting down and disabling the three core facilities at the nuclear complex in, in Yongbyon 
And in so doing, we have effectively halted North Korea's ability to produce weapon grades, weapons grade plutonium, which is really the key ingredient of the nuclear weapons program. We have uh, been, there are three main elements of this uh, nuclear complex. There's a fuel fabrication facility. There's a uh, nuclear reactor. There's also a reprocessing facility where you take the rods from the nuclear reactor and uh, process those into plutonium. All three have been disabled, and it is our hope as we get to a next phase that they will not only be dis disabled, but they will be dismantled as well. We have, in this current phase, we have been leading efforts to press North Korea to provide a full accounting of its nuclear materials, facilities, and programs, including its ambitions for uh, nuclear and uh, uranium enrichment and proliferation activities. And I think our efforts are very much reflected in the October 7 agreement, 07 agreement, in which North Korea agreed to provide a complete and correct declaration and committed not to transfer nuclear materials, technology, or know-how. So um, we will look to uh, when our delegation gets back uh, from Pyongyang, gets back to Washington probably tomorrow night at some point, we'll sit down and see how far or see what additional measures, additional steps we were able to agree with with the North Koreans. And we'll see whether um, we can get uh, the access that we need uh, to help develop a sharper visibility regarding North Korea's nuclear activities. So we, have, uh, we know we have a ways to go. We are working very closely with the Chinese, with all our other partners, to establish verification and monitoring mechanisms to ensure that all parties, including the North Koreans, live up to their, their commitments in the six-party process. And once there is a declaration submitted to the Chinese, we will look at it very carefully to assess what our own uh, requirements will be. And so, um, as the Secretary has stated, verification is the key to all of this. There is no trust me in the six-party process. It is all about our ability to verify commitments that people make, and we will make sure our verification regime within the six parties can deal adequately with these problems. So we look forward to uh, continuing to work with these partners and to get through the end of what we hope will be this, uh, of, of this phase and move on to what we hope will be the last phase, which is the, um, the uh, phase in which North Korea will declare its nuclear materials, what precisely they have, and then we will uh, set up a negotiation to have them turn over these nuclear materials, that is, these fissile materials, and see if they can be uh, uh, given to the international community, and North Korea would then be denuclearized and would return to the non-proliferation treaty. So we got a long way to go, but the uh, practical problem solving and innovation our team has displayed in the six-party process, I think, is an example of what America can do in Asia and in the world. And, you know, this does sort of raise a broader question, which is what type of involvement with Asia and world best suits the United States. I think for 230 plus years, it's obvious that you can't really have a one size fits all uh, approach. Uh, the world around us is just too complex for that. So with all the complexity out there, uh, and given some of the painful experiences since the end of the Cold War, there are those who at times will advocate a sort of real politique approach to, uh, to foreign affairs. Let's just be realistic, pursue our interests. It sounds pretty positive, and uh, what's really, what's the matter with being realistic? But I think, in fact, if you look at the United States and you look at our history, the problem is that real politique of, is just not quite representative of what is in our collective DNA as a country. And really, you go back for almost 400 years, and probably as long as Yale has been here, we have an image of ourselves as a nation that is indeed special, the city upon a hill, as John Winthrop said in, in 1630. And this, I think, very seductive image has translated into actions and policies over the years. It's included a tendency sometimes where we proselytize uh, to try to win people over. We've also had other things like manifest destiny as an example, where, where there has been admittedly quite some negative uh, experiences for us around the world over time. 
And so against this backdrop, I think we realize that a real politique approach to the world cannot adequately reflect who we are as a country. It's really too small a concept to really fully animate our global relationships. The fact is that the United States, frankly, means more to the world, and the world does expect to see us live up to our values. And in fact, I think Americans expect to see us live up to our values. But you know, a funny thing happened on the way to that city upon a hill ideal, and it was called the 20th century. It was a century of seriousness where some big and some very tragic things happened. A couple of world wars, a protracted Cold War, the dropping of, a nuclear of two nuclear bombs. And the United States began to have to deal with the world in a very pragmatic and a very, indeed, a very sober way. But as the 1990s came, the end of the Cold War brought back, I think, some of this international idealism that Americans have had over the centuries. And of course, we're not just talking about the government because since the 1990s, one of the big changes in how we conduct foreign policy or how, frankly, any, conduct, any country conducts foreign policy is that there's been an explosion of American non-state actors involved in foreign affairs life of our country. When you look at non-governmental organizations and other private groups, they are just increasingly active all over, all over the world. Indeed, for many inhabitants of developing countries, their first and only interaction with an American may well not be a U.S. diplomat or U.S. government official, but rather may be an NGO. So NGOs play a very important, very productive role. They're advocates. They also do a great deal of humanitarian work. But what we see in the, in, uh, the light of the, the, uh, the end of the Cold War, the emergence of the U.S., is that sometimes, as Americans have gone out in the world, um, we have had an exp our expression of idealism has sometimes taken a certain form of triumphalism. To be sure, our values have been triumphant, and there, we should not be ashamed to say that. But telling other countries what to do and doing the equivalent of end zone celebrations or imposing our values, this has proved to be, especially I would say in Asia, an ineffective way to inspire our people, uh, inspire people and their, their governments. American values very much do energize people. In particular, what we have done, far more than really what we have said, is important. And I would say our 200-year example of democracy, of inventiveness, economic and social openness has been a true inspiration to Asians, and I see this wherever I go in, in Asia. So as we approach Asia and the rest of the world, we need to somehow synthesize those values, that is our humanism, our reverence for education and invention, in fact, frankly, our openness, with a pragmatic, realistic view of the world, and to make sure we always do this with a great measure of humility. I think Americans will figure this out. I think we can be that great example uh, to other countries, and I think we have a lot to offer. But I think we need, to, we need to do this in a way that we set this example and people, people will follow us in so doing. I think Yale, with its inspiring international pedigree, is already playing a role in this. The Yale China Law Center, which has helped China chart a course leading to genuine rule of law, is a good example of what this kind of production, productive activity is, where we set an example and people will follow this example. We see Yale scholars and professors and ambassadors, too, spread out uh, across Asia and represent, I think, the best and most thoughtful side of our, of our country. And I hope Yale will indeed keep this up. And uh, I want to thank you all and uh, tell you what a great honor it's been, to hear, it's been to be here at Yale. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Would you like to feel your I'll help. Yes, sir. Well, with the understanding that Iran is not in my uh, parish, um, I would again, I'd caution on the idea that there are 
you know, sort of one size fits all. And we do have a multilateral approach with, with, with Iran. Um, you know, in North Korea, we're dealing with a country that uh, has not only uh, produced fissile material, but proudly produced fissile material. They've actually exploded a bomb in October 06. So there's a certain, um, uh, it's a different dynamic from, from Iran, where we have a country that continues to deny that it's even engaged in this, uh, in this weapons, weapons program. Um, I'm not in really a position to recommend that what we do in uh, North Korea or with North Korea can apply to the situation in Iran, except to say that, um, you know, y you have to really work on it every day. There's no macro management of this. You've really got to be engaged on it every day. And uh, we try to work it step by step with the North Koreans, not that we want step by step. I mean, I would prefer to have them wake up one morning, make a strategic decision to get rid of these weapons of mass destruction and be done in time to, you know, watch the Red Sox that evening. It's not going to happen. I mean, we, we need to work this uh, every day and through the day and try to break this up into small chunks and see if they, uh, if we can coax them along and see if they believe that they're in a better position by moving them uh, and then whether they'll go further. Um, the problem with the step-by-step -step approach is, uh, you know, you do have things that uh, happen along the way. You have, uh, you know, things get hung up and people think the process is over. Um, it's not, but, uh, you know, you, you do have uh, good days and bad days. So, again, I, I, I think um, Iran has a certain uh, view of itself in the Middle East, and North Korea has a certain view of itself in Northeast Asia. I think they're rather different views. If you look at a map, North Korea is the smallest country in Northeast Asia, uh, much smaller, um, a tiny economy compared to anyone else. I think Iran has a rather different aspirations for itself in the region, and that may lead you to a kind of a different approach. Let me get a student. Any student out there? Yeah. Do you have experience dealing with uh, relations with Asia in your whole diplomatic career? Is there anything that particularly surprised you um, in the general question? But is there anything that in your capacity you're being surprised by or something that much you want to pass on? Well, um, I don't know if it's surprising, but I think uh, um, sometimes people, in, in, in Asia, I mean, again, I don't want to make these kind of crass uh, cultural generalizations, but when you're the big guy, uh, it's very important uh, not to um, be too aggressive about how you deal with a little guy. Now, in many cases, the little guy is causing the problem, but, you know, people just look at the relative size and... Um, they'll kind of be sticking up for the little guy. I mean, it's, you know, happens in the U.S. too. I always root for those baseball teams on the bottom of the uh, uh, standings. But uh, I, think it, I think you really have to be aware of it in Asia. And, and uh, for a part of the world that's famous for this sort of vertical orientation, hierarchy, big guy, strong, et cetera, you, know, you really have to be aware that often there's a lot of sympathy for the little guy there. And if you're going to pursue it, you better be a little, you know, show respect to people. And the whole notion of showing respect to your seniors, there's also something about showing respect to people who are not your seniors. So I think you've got to be kind of aware of these things. Um, you know, I don't know if that's uniquely Asian, frankly. I think a, a lot of what you do in dis diplomacy, you, you learned in the proverbial uh, elementary school playground. Uh, it's good to have friends, <laughs> good to have allies, you know. If someone's beating you up in a playground, it's good to have someone else who will take care of your problem for you. Um, but um, I think uh, America, you know, as we approach Asia, we need to uh, do it with uh, an understanding that, uh, um, you know, the history has not always been a, a, a good history. And uh, some people will perceive us as outsiders no matter what we do. And uh, I just think we have to do it in a uh, very respectful tone. I mean, um, when you look at, uh, there's a view in China that, you know, the, with the, you look at the Tibet situation, and, you know, I think we all know 
Tibet situation. I mean, it's on the front pages of the newspapers. But you know, to understand how Chinese view this, it's not just a government issue; it's a people issue. Uh, and so you have to kind of bear that uh, bear that in mind. It's uh, um, you know, I think in general terms, uh, Americans would do better to uh, spend a lot more time on history. Uh, and the trouble for me is when you go to college 30 years ago, the history I studied, I, the political science I studied is now history. And, uh, but what's interesting is the history I studied is now kind of political science. You know, when I studied the break, breakup of the Ottoman Empire, I never thought I'd be dealing with uh, the situation of Kosovo and other places in the Balkans. And to understand the dynamics there, you were wise to uh, check out your late 19th century history. Uh, yes, sir. I was just wondering how stable do you think the North Korean regime is on the end of the cloud? Yeah. Well, if you uh, turn around, you'll see some people with notebooks. And they're not good students. They're just good reporters. So it's probably not a good thing for me to be speculating on the stability of the uh, regime in, in North Korea. I mean, they would love me to. But, uh, you know, I got to deal with these guys the next day. Um, I would say, uh, I would say that... Um, you know, North Korea is getting to the point where they've got to make some choices. And, uh, you know, these, whatever they thought nuclear weapons were going to do for them in terms of preserving their, uh, uh, you know, their, um, their state, they, they need to understand that problems, you know, when you look at state collapse in the world, usually countries that collapse don't collapse because someone else comes in and, uh, you know, in the 19th century sense. Uh, they usually have internal problems. And so I think it behooves countries to pay a lot of attention to those in internal problems, and often those internal problems are economic problems. And so when you look at the North Korea's, you know, uh, I mean, I could facetiously say you look at their top 100 problems, you can look at their top 1,000 problems, I think you would agree nuclear weapons aren't going to solve any one of them. So nuclear weapons have, for North Korea, resulted in, uh, in it being very isolated. Now, for a North Korean leadership, you don't want to be, if you're too isolated, they realize if they're too isolated, that is very problematic for them. But if they're worried about opening up as well, and whether a rapid opening up could cause uh, you know, instability factors. So I would not want to be a North Korean policy maker right now. I, I think they have very few, uh, few options out there. Um, I like to think that we are providing them a means by which to get out of this nuclear business, and I think the day they do that will be a very good, good day for their country. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Can you ask a question loud so everybody can hear it? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, secondly, my, uh, another question I have is you mentioned towards the end of your talk that America should hold itself as an example to the rest of the world. Given that in the past years, um, with Guantanamo and problems with, you know, has towards the continent or not, um, and that the American moral example has been pushed away in a way to the world time. Yeah. Well, first of all, with regard to the North Korean uh, human rights record, uh, if, if North Korea truly aspires to membership in the international community, they're going to have to do a lot of things, and I would put right up there on the top of the list, improving their human rights record. Um, you know, you could argue, well, where, you know, where do they start? Because, uh, frankly, it's a human rights record which, um, you know, I don't think we'd get a very good grade here at Yale. Uh, so um, I think what we would like to do at some point, and maybe at an early point, is if we're talking about bringing in North Korea and the international community in the context of their giving up their nuclear weapons, I think it would be very useful to have a human rights dialogue. 
And uh, I think what the North Koreans need to understand is human rights are not some weapon uh, that we're using against them. It's not some way that we're trying to humiliate them. It's frankly, if you look at the history of the human rights mo movement, uh, it's really a, an expression of uh, dignity of, of people and uh, uh, the importance that needs to be attached to that as a member of the international community. So I don't think um, it is useful to talk to them in an angry tone about it. I think it's uh, useful to talk in a very sober tone to them and explain that if they do want to be part of the international community, which I think is the only way they can really survive, I, I don't think countries can live apart from the international community, they are going to have to live up to certain standards and human rights is one where they are not, not there. You know, as for the United States, um, you mentioned a couple of incidents in recent years, but, you know, frankly, you could go back, I mean, in my lifetime, uh, uh, you could look at segregation in the South. Uh, you could look at uh, racism uh, through, you know, in many parts of this country. Um, you know, in, in, in my youth, you could look at, uh, you could look at, you know, a lot of failings of the United States in terms of, of human rights. Uh, a lot of issues, uh, yet I, th I like to think, I mean, that our country has addressed these through, a, um, through an open process. And uh, I don't think any American should get up and say we're perfect and why can't you be perfect as well. I think what we need to be clear about is we have problems and we're dealing with those problems. You've dealt with, you've mentioned some very specific policy issues. But those specific policy issues are very much being, uh, being debated, discussed in our government, in our courts, uh, in, our, in, in our newspapers. And so whatever one's opinion about some of these things, uh, I think we can agree that the United States is trying to, trying to work, through these, uh, work through these things. I had the uh, privilege of um, being overseas when I was uh, seven and eight years old. Uh, and uh, I remember foreigners, I mean, when I was seven years old, and, and making comments about, you know, why do you, uh, why do you discriminate against black people? Why do you do these things? And I remember coming home, because I hadn't seen this, and talking, uh, you know, explaining to my mother, who is, uh, you know, from a very sort of abolitionist type from Massachusetts, and, uh, you know, she, um, she explained to me, you know, what was going on in, in, in places, uh, you know, in school desegregation issues and things like that. And I, I felt this momentary, you know, sense of shame that our country was doing this. You know, I was only eight years old. But oh, my God, you know. Um, but, you know, I've come to understand, I came to understand that we're dealing with it. And uh, I think that's our greatest strength. And our strength is not that we're perfect. Our strength is that we deal with things openly. And I hope we'll continue to do that. Yes? That's you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not one of your economics professors, but I'll take a uh, crack a, at that one, which is if you look at the com composition of South Korean exports to China, and then you look at the composition of Chinese exports to the United States, you'll see a connection. So I don't think that the fact that, uh, you know, component parts going in uh, from South Korean factories that go into Chinese, uh, um, you know, Game Boys or whatever, uh, uh, means that somehow South Korea is shifting to China. I think it's just part of a very uh, of an ongoing global uh, globalized uh, supplier network. Um, you know, I was in Camp David last week with the uh, with last weekend with our with our president and with the new South Korean president, and the South Korean president spoke in very uh, very clear terms about South Korea's desire to have good relations with its neighbors, uh, China and. Um, and uh, Japan, 
and also uh, to have this very special relationship with the U.S. And I, I look to uh, South Korea to continue that, and, and the reason is I think it's very much in South Korea's interest. They want to have good relations with those two larger neighbors, but they also want to have a relationship with a distant power. I'm sure that's a model that some professor has written a book about. Um, by the way, read all you can now, because once you start working, it's tough to read. I mean, I, mean, I barely get to the sports page these days. But. Yeah. A lot of people, I think, are who look at the economic dependence of North Korea on China and say China bears more leverage than almost any other country. Um, and it's one of the few yeah. relations with North Korea. Yeah. Uh, I wonder why, why this process wouldn't be expedited if yeah. uh, they didn't put more weight on it if they really do care about it. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, there's no question that China shares our goal about denuclearizing North Korea. There's absolutely no reason in the world why China would want to see North Korea continue to develop nuclear weapons. I mean, there are a bunch of obvious reasons for that. I mean, the proliferation issues, uh, um, you know, uh, the danger that other countries would feel they need to develop nuclear weapons, et cetera, et cetera. But um, you're asking a question, really, of how is China prepared to try to achieve this objective? Now, um, one of the, uh, I think one of the answers really does indeed start with a map. You look at a map and you see China is uh, North Korea's uh, uh, neighbor and that, in fact, you know, China could cut off all aid to North Korea and uh, uh, cause a lot of economic or more economic hardship. And, and the question is, would that achieve the goal? And I think the Chinese believe it, it doesn't. Um, and moreover, I think when you look at how China tries to deal with its neighbors, it's not really the way it tries to approach that. Um, if you're 10,000 miles away from a country, you might want to boycott the country. If you're the neighbor, you might be thinking, well, these people are going to be our neighbors for the rest of history, so is this the way we want to, we want to go on this? Uh, you might also, and because China is a big country, and like most big countries, foreign policy issues sometimes derive out of domestic politics. It's a shocking thought, but uh, it happens. And so um, if you're in China and you're looking at North Korea, what does that mean to you? Well, it's a, uh, it's a communist state. Uh, now, if you're a business leader in Shanghai, do you care? Maybe not, but if you're a communist party member, maybe you do care about that. So. That could, you know, you have within China, you have party elements, you have government elements, maybe they have a different view of this. You have uh, military elements, you have civilian elements, maybe they have a different view. You have reformers in China, that is people want to really move fast on these reforms. And then you have people saying, wait a minute, how are we going to square this with our Marxist-Leninism? There are a lot of those people still around, your rural or urban issues. And so how would the collapse of North Korea affect these debates within China? Hard to say, but they would probably affect those debates. Um, so I think when China looks at it, there are a whole host of domestic political calculations that are probably uh, going, going into that. And so, you know, if you look at a newspaper, they use, it's often the thing, well, China doesn't want to destabilize North Korea because they're afraid of North Korean refugees. Okay. I, I mean, I, I don't rule that out at all. I mean, I'm sure that's one of it. But I'm just trying to suggest that maybe there are a whole host of other issues that make it uh, tough to make that what is really a historic decision when you shut off a neighbor. Uh, I mean, we haven't had that. We've never shut off Mexico or shut off Canada. I guess we've invaded both at various times, but uh, uh, not lately. So, um, I, you know, I think it's a, it's a tough calculation for them. Um, what I'm pleased about is that we are kind of in sync when we talk with the Chinese on this issue of, of North Korea. And I think uh, as we have embraced the six-party process with China in the chair, I think it's uh, um, we have been able to come closer to China as a result of this six-party process. And I'm hoping that this sort of thing will yield dividends as we 
continue to deal with, with you know, other problems. I mean, the problem in Darfur. I mean, China has made some changes in Darfur. They've understood that you can't just look at Sudan as a source of energy. You've got to consider how Sudan is being regarded, uh, you know, what kind of humanitarian situation there is. And so there is, there's clearly an evolution in how China is looking at some of these issues. And I think it's in our interest to uh, be with them to try to work through these problems. Uh, yes. Yes. I'm sorry, what is the concern? What, what is the valid concern about? Um, on China. Well, you know, the six-party process is a pretty broad, uh, strong platform on which you can do a number of different things. And um, the idea that you're all going to six uh, sit there with six uh, delegations <coughs> I mean, it is, it, it is a remarkable thing when you have these plenaries. I've described this to some uh, audiences where you have these big white plastic uh, um, sort of uh, fake tulips. And uh, when you, and it's this huge uh, six-sided table with these, this uh, flower display in the middle of these five tulips. And when you begin to talk, they all light up because the interpreters have begun to translate. And so you say, well, it's great to be here today, and then they all light up. And then you wait for each tulip to go out, meaning that the Korean, the Russian, the Chinese, the Japanese, um, you know, they've all finished translating your sentence. So you wait, and then they all go out, and then you make your next, next sentence and wait and, until they all go out. You know, you can't really do business too well doing that. You know, you're, you spend all your time looking at white tulips. And so, I, um, so you, you know, you, you, we've needed a bilateral process, and uh, what is important for us is, to some extent, I think the, uh, you know, sometimes the North Koreans have sort of wanted to, exa uh, to sort of deal with the Americans, and, uh, you know, that's fine, but we're going to deal with the others, and uh, we expect uh, these other relationships to, to gel because, as I said earlier, when we look at the six-party talks, we see something that can gel into some sort of framework even beyond the North Korea, uh, some sort of multilateral framework uh, beyond the North Korea problem. So, um, you know, we're not going to allow the North Koreans and come to us and, and uh, you know, talk about Japan. We're going to say, you talk to the Japanese. And so um, I think we're succeeding in that. Now, with regard to uh, South Korea, you know, South Korea has had a, had a uh, very important election in December and, and, uh, and in April with the parliamentary election. They moved from a, uh, a center-left government to a center-right government. And I think it's important to keep that word center in there in both cases because, uh, you know, South Korea is not an extremist form of government. And, uh, but, um, you know, I think what, what was important for the U.S., especially with a center-left government which paid a great deal of attention to the sunshine policy of dealing directly with the North Koreans. I think what, what was important for us was to really respect the history that one of the great tragedies of the 20th century was this division of Korea. I, you know, we, when you think about it, no one thought this would happen. I mean, we, we were... Uh, talking about who will take surrender of the Japanese troops north of the 38th parallel, who will take surrender of the Japanese troops south of the 38th parallel. No one thought this would be two different countries 50, uh, 60 years later. So this is a great, for, for Korean people, it is a great tragedy, terrible tragedy. So if the U.S. looks like we're always trying to keep the Koreans from working together, uh, we can create a situation where 
Some people can say, why are you preventing us from dealing with each other? Uh, are you uh, trying to keep Koreans down or keep Koreans weak? So I think the U.S., we, you know, clearly, you know, we didn't want a situation where the South Koreans were engaging with the North Koreans in a way that made some of the leverage created in the six-party talks, where we talk about providing fuel oil to the North Koreans, where that leverage gets undermined by what's going on in the, in the north-south process. So we, we really tried to manage that situation, making sure there was good communication between the um, north-south process and the six-party process. I think we managed that. And what I like to think is when the South Korean people came to vote for their president and for their, uh, their uh, new National Assembly, the issue of the U.S., the issue of how we were dealing with these issues was not an issue. You know, that the U.S. people uh, went to those elections, uh, you know, asking whether the, uh, uh, you know, one party could do better with economic growth than the other party, the sort of thing you like to see in, a, in, a, in, in an election. So I think we managed that. And now, of course, uh, they have a, a, a government that I think is expecting more reciprocity from the North Koreans. Uh, the North Koreans have clearly contained their enthusiasm for this uh, new South Korean government. Uh, I think the North Koreans are going to have to uh, understand that uh, they have to deal with this, and uh, you know South Korea is going to be important to them, uh, whether they like it or not. And I think in the long run, even in the medium run, we're going to be fine on this. Yes, sir. The, the incentives uh, for North Korea? Okay. Do you want to get that phone or uh, no? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, what we did was we, um, you know, in the 1990s, there was something called the Agreed Framework. And basically, uh, North Korea is in constant need of fuel oil. Um, but because they have these very old uh, Eastern European factories, often East German factories, and they require this very heavy uh, fuel oil, this, this stuff that, uh, <laughs> You know, uh, people familiar with the Navy from the 1940s, 1950s would know what it looks like. It's very thick black stuff, uh, heavy fuel oil, HFO. Um, that is a kind of fuel oil that we like to provide them because they don't have the cracking facilities that could turn the fuel oil into diesel or, or in any way run military equipment. It's just a heavy fuel oil that can be used in certain factories, including some uh, electricity and heating plants. So in the, in the 1990s, we had something called the Agreed Framework, and we provided this fuel oil as long as North Korea kept the reactor shut down. And it was basically the best deal we could get out of the process. Now what we have is we said to the North Koreans last spring, in order to shut down the reactor and the, the facility, we'll give you 50,000 tons of fuel oil. So we gave them 50,000 tons, boom, they shut it down. In order to get more, they needed to go more into denuclearization. So going from just pulling a switch and shutting it down to actually disabling the facility, when you disable it, it means it's not going to, you can't bring it up very easily. It's going to cost them an awful lot and take them a lot of time. So the North Koreans uh, asked for a lot more fuel oil for disabling. So we put together, a pro um, and by the way, it's not just with the U.S. We have several other countries in the six-party process uh, supplying this. So we gave them a total of 950,000 tons uh, in order to get through the this, this so-called second phase. And with respect to the, uh, the nuclear facilities, that was in respect to several steps to... Um, uh, several steps that would disable the reactor, the reprocessing uh, facility, and the uh, uh, fuel fabrication facility. Now, how much is 950,000 tons? Well, it was, we found that um, it's probably, in terms of their overall need, maybe four or five months of fuel oil. Uh, now, what we've done is we gave them some fuel oil equivalents so that uh, when they, um, they needed um, some equipment, and we worked out with the Chinese what the equipment would be, and we figured out what it would be as a unit of this heavy fuel oil. Sorry to go into all these details, but I know them. And so uh, um, the result was that um, they have used about 
50, 60 percent of the fuel oil or fuel oil equivalent do them. That is 950,000 tons. They've probably gone through the equivalent about 550, 600, something like that. And so in order to get more fuel oil, we're going to have to go even deeper into denuclearization. And what we anticipate is that after disabling the facility, you know, taking part the parts, uh, you know, leaving them on the ground, et cetera. Um, we're going to go to a so-called dismantlement phase where this stuff will be carted out of the country, and then we'll probably give them more fuel oil even for that. The real question, and the question that quite frankly keeps me up at night, is when we get to this final stage and we're dismantling their nuclear facilities, they have this separated plutonium, and ind indeed we had a team in, in North Korea discussing precisely how much separated plutonium, that is how much plutonium has been produced out of this facility over the years, and a lot was produced in the last few years. So we have whatever it is, 30, 40, 50 kilos uh, of this separated plutonium. And so in this last stage, the North Koreans will be across the table with this bomb-making material, and we got to get them to give up the bomb-making material. Can we do it with fuel oil, uh, give them uh, more fuel oil? I mean, it's really going to come down to this very tough negotiation. If we can get this stuff out of them, that will be the real key to denuclearizing North Korea. Yeah. No, we have, um, right now we have Russia, the U.S., China, and South Korea participating in this consortium on fuel oil and fuel oil equivalents. Uh, Japan has not yet participated because they have an issue with, um, I mean, it, it's a separate issue, but it has to do with the fact, the fact that North Korea abducted some of their citizens in the late 70s and early 80s. This is a huge issue in Japan. It's not just an issue for the government. It's an issue for the, the public. And so Japan is not participating until they get a little progress, uh, you know, some, some step forward on that. So um, at the um, other countries are doing some things. Uh, for example, uh, you know, South Korea is calibrating what they do north-south with how we're doing in the six parties. Um, so there's some calibration there going on, but any kind of uh, substantial bilateral aid programs, that will probably await this next, uh, this next phase. Uh, the U.S., we've agreed to take a couple of uh, political uh, gestures, that is, having to do with removing North Korea from a list of, uh, of state, spons state sponsors of, uh, of terrorism um, and uh, removing them. And so we're prepared to do that at a certain moment. And similarly, we have something called the Trading with the Enemy Act, and it is one of the authorities that holds in place sanctions against North Korea. Now, there are a lot of other authorities that hold in place sanctions against North Korea. Trading with the Enemy Act, uh, I think what has really exercised the North, Korean about that, North Koreans about that is the word enemy, just as they don't like the word terrorism, because uh, you know, they did sign up to a number of UN covenants. They have, we don't have any reports that they've been engaged in terrorism in, in over 20 years. So, so those are two additional elements that we're working through. Uh, yes, sir. Some of those of us who work on non-proliferation, including myself, are curious about the more broader issue of how we deal with proliferation. And the United States is involved in a kind of paradox which some of us call the 11th Commandment. We try to keep the 11th Commandment, which is thou shalt not. <laughs> well, let's say. Uh, and, and I should say, I've, I've done more work on South Asia in this area, but one issue in many talks that I've been in given has always come back to Hiroshima. And I think that the two issues are very directly linked. It takes some time to extrapolate that. But I'm curious, as someone, as an American representative, who talks on immigration, what is your own view? Do you differ with General Eisenhower? That uh, 
I mean, I have personal views on all of these issues, rather strong personal views, but I'm not sure I should be standing up here and talking about my personal views of, uh, of uh, Hiroshima. I, I, I'm just not sure that's an, a, it's an appropriate forum to um, get into that. Uh, be happy to talk to you privately about it. Um, I think um, how to make sure the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, how to make sure it works, how to make sure that we can deal with uh, nuclear uh, proliferation pressures, because the technology is out there, as we all know. And how we do that, I think, is one of the fundamental issues of our day. Uh, you know, climate change, understandably, gets a tremendous amount of uh, discussion in the public, but I think uh, these proliferation issues uh, should should be seen more broadly as you are doing than just looking at, you know, how are we doing in this Iran negotiation? Should we have a six-party talks there versus how are we doing in, uh, in uh, North Korea? Um, you mentioned South Asia. That's a very uh, uh, apt place to, to, uh, to deal with this. Um, occasionally, you know, the North Koreans have said, you know, why can't we have India? Uh, why can't we have an India solution where uh, why can't we, uh, you know, well, why don't you treat us like India? And then, you know, you try to patiently explain why North Korea is not India. Uh, yeah, it doesn't take long or it takes a long time, whichever you choose. Uh, you know, I think when you, uh, you know, a number of people have looked at this issue, it's a, uh, um, there was a rather extraordinary op-ed about a year and a half ago that was co-authored by a number of our uh, former uh, secretaries of state. I think uh, also uh, Bill Perry was there. I think it was Schultz, Perry, Kissinger, uh, a couple of others. And I think they were really exploring the issue of um, whether in the NPT um, where, where it calls for countries who are the nuclear states whether, you know, how should those countries begin their obligations in the NPT to build down. Um, you know, I think um, it's, when you look at what this administration has had to deal with, with this global war on terrorism, with the situation in Iraq, with, you know, and, and then dealing with non-proliferation issues, it, this is quite a full plate. But I predict that uh, the next administration, uh, whoever it is, uh, whoever he or she is, is going to have to uh, to deal with this uh, with this with this issue because, in proliferation, we just cannot fail. I mean, we we have a situation where the technology is uh, is is too. Uh, it's it's very difficult to control the movement to control proliferation. Um, you know this. Uh, uh, Syria issue that we've talked about. I mean, this was a, a reactor that was only really discovered as being a reactor in recent years, even though it's been, uh, it was in construction for uh, seven or, or more years, if I'm not, if I'm correct. So, um, you know, I think, you know, there's been this idea of the proliferation security initiative, so-called PSI, um, where you try to work out with other countries certain standards and, and uh, uh, means to communicate with each other. Clearly, we need that sort of thing. But I think we really need a, uh, a much uh, stronger consensus in the, in the world that we're going to deal with this problem uh, because uh, it is uh, really a fundamentally existential issue. I mean, if we ever had a situation where, uh, you know, a nuclear weapon is exploded by a terrorist or, or, some, uh, or even in exploded in, in anger between two countries, uh, uh, it will just change the world as we know it. We have to. We have to address this. Yeah. Can you talk for a second about the uh, reliability of verification schemes in the Six Party Because you know to ensure that a they disclose all of their nuclear yeah. activities. Yeah. 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 I mean, we were, we were, we looked at, you know, you look at certain indicators and uh, um, you may not have uh, identified any kind of facility for enrichment, but you look at certain purchasing uh, activities and you ask, well, why are they buying that? 
And some of the stuff is dual use, but you know you can piece together that, well, wait a minute, they're not buying this type of uh, uh, lubricant for you know bicycles or something. They're buying it for something else. So, uh, so you know it's a it's a very inexact science trying to put this uh, put this together. Um, we have in in North Korea we have a uh, you know there's a fact there that they have produced plutonium, and we've got to. Um, We've got to succeed in um, getting them to give up that plutonium, and uh, believe me, it's not easy. Um, they need to declare a certain amount of plutonium, what they have, and we've had some very, very detailed conversations in, in recent days about that. Um, but once they declare it, you know, there's no trust me in this business. I mean, you can't say, oh, well, thanks very much, sounds about right. Uh, you know, we need. Um, there are certain technical means that you can uh, you can check this. Now, one of it is one of the things you look at is production records. Just as a as an auditor coming into a business, you know, look at the books and can make certain uh, draw certain facts from the books. Um, but you don't want to just do that. You want to have some physical access, and you want to be able to use um, you know some scientific means and and uh, I would say our country has done a lot to develop some of these uh, detection uh, means some of these uh, verification means um, but you know you get to the point where you can find you know a verification means that you're prepared to live with and, and you know uh, you have to you have to make a judgment uh, on that um, my own judgment is we can get a verification of uh, of their denuclearization. I think we can achieve it. If they cooperate, we can achieve verification. Uh, we'll have, uh, you know, some people will have more intrusive ideas about how to do it than other people. Um, but I think, I think we can do it such that when we make a determination that we can go forward on this, uh, I think, uh, you know, we have some pretty hard-nosed people who are going to look very, you know, very, you know, with a real jaundiced eye at this, and I can assure you, if we make the decision to go forward, it's because we believe we can verify what we got. Uh, Ambassador, I think we have time for one more question. It's yours. You know, I hate the last question thing because it, it's often, but you look like a nice person, so <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you've thought of that, huh? <laughs> well, you know, you'll have to ask them. Um, I, 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 my impression from all the campaigns is, uh, you know, when the new president comes in, uh, you know, and checks out the Oval Office, and, you know, checks out the uh, chair behind the desk. The first thing that he or she is going to have to deal with, they would rather it not be a uh, North Korean nuclear issue. So I think there's an incentive for everyone to try to move this along. But, um, you know, I've said many, many times, I mean, here we are in, in end of April. Uh, some of the journalists here who are scribbling down in their notebooks, desperately hoping I'm going to say something new on this. Um, can tell you that I predicted, well, if we don't get this done in February, that's a big problem. And if we don't get this done in March, it's a big problem. And now they're about to hear me say, we've really got to get this done very soon because it's going to be a big problem. Um, right, Tomo? You have that? Do you write that down there? Uh, there be a great article. Uh, yeah. Groundhog Day there for. <laughs> uh, um, you know, I, I think realistically speaking, um, we got to get on with that last phase that I described, this phase where we go to dismantlement and, and I hope the turnover of fissile material. And if we don't get going on it quickly, I think it, it, it there would just be not enough days in the remaining part of the year to do it. Um, look, if the North Koreans want to do this, um, it can be done. Uh, but. It's um, with the the North Koreans. They they really you know every every you know you you measure your political mileage with them in inches. I mean every every issue needs to be go. We go very slowly. Sometimes we go slowly because you know we want to make sure verification means are 
are adequate. Sometimes they go very slowly. Uh, so it's uh, we got to really get to it real quick. But if they want to, if they wake up tomorrow morning and say we're done with all this, uh, haul that stuff away, uh, we can get it done real quick. Well, it, re it remains for me to uh, invite everybody to join us up on the second floor uh, reception and to thank Ambassador Hill for an extremely stimulating and uh, illuminating talk. Yeah. Thank you so much. For thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.